Hey, we have Jules Mitchell here, the wonderful, the fabulous, wonderful Jules Mitchell, who is one of my personal favorite people to learn from and have learned from for like years, years, actually, now that I'm saying this and uh, where I'm so grateful for what Jules is sharing in the yoga world of bringing research based information in a really non dogmatic and encouraging and supportive way. And so one of the things I love about you, Jules, is the way that you share information that's not coming from this, like, I'm the expert, I'm the biomechanic scientist. It's more like, hey, everybody, there's a lot of misconceptions in yoga, let's learn more. Oh, and research keeps changing, and let's learn more. So this is my personal way of introducing you, but Jules, please tell us other stuff about you, anything you want to okay. share as we get started. Sure. I don't know what you want to know. Um, I live in Las Vegas with my cat. <laughs> we'll start with that. <laughs> um, yeah, I teach biomechanics to yoga teachers, uh, biomechanics and anatomy, exercise science, that kind of stuff, um, which, you know, the topics that are important to yoga teachers used to be stretching, still is stretching. So I do a lot of stretching uh, teaching what it is, how it works, how it doesn't work, uh, that kind of stuff. And then um, in the most recent years, uh, strength has kind of taken over the yoga conversation. So that is a big part of my work now. Well, and isn't it funny having been in this yoga world, hey, for a long time, where we see that these there, there are these kind of trends or... Why are they trans or I don't know how we would describe them, but we see, yeah, like stretching, what is stretching? What's not stretching? And then it's mobility and now it's strength and who knows what the next little bit will be. But it definitely, I feel like it dovetails a little bit with what we're seeing in generalized movement education. And maybe as, and you'll know this a little bit more of what research is coming out and research changes, but it's interesting to see how it's mirrored in, in yoga asana and what we see in yoga mm -hmm. and talking specifically about strength. Cause I'm excited about this because strength fundamentally is something that we need. And as we age, we absolutely need it more. So my first question to you, what is strength? And I know, of course, every question we're going to ask here could absolutely be 10 hours alone on the answers. Mm -hmm. But I guess let's start with a sense of like, what is strength objectively outside of yoga asana, outside of any other thing? And like, how do you, through the lens in which you've learned movement and anatomy through biomechanics in that sense, how does that inform and what strength for you? If if you want to measure whether someone has strength or ha does not have strength, uh, then we would need a measure. Um, and the measure generally is uh, how much you can lift, <laughs> right? Like just, you know, if I'm going to just the strength of my arm or the strength of my bicep, how much I can, how, how much iron I can move, you know, how much uh, resistance I can overcome. Uh, and that's generally measured in kilograms, generally, you know, maybe Newtons, depending on what we're looking at. Um, so that's technically what strength is. Um, how you get it is a whole complex, major conversation that I'm sure we're going to touch on. Um, but I, I want to separate before we do that, I want to kind of separate um, strength from um a different term, maybe like capacity or tolerance, because I think people that are listening that might be a little familiar with my work might have heard that conversation quite a bit. Um, and that's like, you know, I use that a lot in the connective tissue work, which is like, you know, the ability to tolerate certain loads, you know, like how dense are your bones, the ability to tolerate, you know, compression, that kind of stuff. And that we use that sometimes as strength. You know, I have strong tendons, I have strong bones. Um, but it's different. Like that's not the same as when I'm talking about the ability to generate an impulse from the nervous system and create a force that can overcome, you know, an immovable object or something, you know? So, so we, I'm highlighting this because we use the term strength colloquially in a lot of different ways. And most of the time it, there, there's really no clear definition. It just like, everybody knows what it means to be strong, but until you actually start pulling on the thread, then you're like, oh, well, what am I actually measuring? What am I, what is, what is the variable that I'm actually considering and, and how am I measuring it? So, you know, if you go into the strength research, like if you're seeing a strength and conditioning coach, 
that's going to be very specific to the ability to produce a force versus like us talking about strong bones is a very different conversation, you know? And then I think that's really, and I'm glad you pointed that out because I think that's really reflected of so much of the terms that we use colloquially, mm. like flexibility, mm -hmm. <laughs> hence all of the different science Mobility. and stretching courses that you've mm -hmm. offered over the years and continue to offer because it's a never ending conversation. And especially because for those who are yoga teachers, when we teach the average person who maybe doesn't care as much as we do, about mm -hmm. stretching, about strength. And so it's fi that fine line too of finding the words that you mm -hmm. know sort of mean everything to everybody, but maybe knowing that it also means more and where's that line? What do we have to know? It's a can yeah. of beautiful worms, I yeah. think. And I think you do a wonderful job of continuing to educate and offer that. Let's move then into the move from the can of worms of like what is just strength from a scientific perspective to then of course here we are this is a yoga podcast we teach yoga you and i our listeners practice teach yoga mm -hmm. so when it comes to yoga asana and the movement aspect of the practice and we say oh let's say warrior one is will help strengthen your quadriceps mm -hmm. or down dog might strengthen your arms what does like what does that even mean what are we saying or what should we yeah. say is there something else yeah. that we should be saying you don't have to change the way you speak <laughs> i think that's the most important part um I think a lot of people end up taking my courses and walk away with, I shouldn't say strength. I should say stiffness. I shouldn't say flexibility. I should say lengthen or like whatever. Like now you're just getting in the weeds, to be honest. Um, the communication is fine. Like everybody understands what it means to get stronger. Like that's fine. They don't need all the little details. Uh, but you know, as on the teacher side of things, it is helpful to understand all of the underlying components of what it means to get stronger so that you can actually help someone achieve the goals specific to their needs. So if you don't understand that, you know, the person might just, they, they just want to get stronger, but you need to understand what the limitations are and why and what adaptations would be appropriate for that person. So it doesn't mean you need to change your language. They, they're still getting stronger. That strength is the outcome of a variety of adaptations. So the, the consumer just wants the outcome. They just want to get stronger. But in order for you as the teacher to help the, the student get stronger, you need to understand the adaptations that you can you know, provide them. So, so let me just define an adaptation, right? An adaptation is the ability, or you know, maybe being able to adapt, is the ability for a, a, an organism to um, change in order to be better suited to its environment, right? So that's an adaptation. Um, and then from that adaptation, you can get strength as an outcome. So like, let me give an example. Um, if I'm not used to moving on a slippery surface, like ice, let's just say I live in Las Vegas, it's 120 degrees right now. So we don't, we don't do much on ice here, although we do have a great hockey team, but separate story. Um, so now all of a sudden, I'm going to be a lot more focused on coordinating myself so I don't fall over and slip. And so therefore, my strength is going to go down. But I didn't just get weaker. Does that make sense? I'm focusing on some other aspect. But once I learn how to coordinate on something slippery, my strength will go up. Right. So I can like, let's just say I'm trying to lift weights on a slippery surface for some reason. I don't know. But let's just say, you know, as soon as I'm like, know that I'm not going to slip, my feet are, are, are going to give out from under me, I'll be able to lift more weights. So so I just got stronger as an outcome. Do you see what I'm saying? But I didn't like build more muscle mass. Do, like there, so, so there's a lot of components that that come that play a part in somebody being stronger. So I think like to answer your question, like, you know, does downward dog strengthen your arms? Well, if you're not someone who's ever pushed the floor away from you, like there's a huge aspect there of your brain sorting out how to do that. You will get stronger at it. 
it's going to be, you know, finite, you know what I mean? You're not going, you know, like at some point you're going to need to do something else. It's not going to translate directly into holding all your body weight in like a head a handstand for three minutes. You know, you're going to de- need to be doing more specific stuff, but in the beginning, there's a lot of coordinative aspects to it. So I think there's, that that's the important part. Like there are nervous system adaptations that are a part of strength things like coordination, things like reduction and co-contraction, um, things like motor unit recruitment that's related to like perception of effort. And all of those things can happen in a yoga practice. So that's saying that yoga can get you stronger. But at the same time, I would never go to a strength and conditioning coach and they would never give me downward dog as the strength exercise. Does that make sense? So I think we get lost in the weeds in like what I like to call like industry pageantry. Everyone's bickering at each other, like yoga is not strengthening. You know, it's like, no, 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 no. You know, yoga might not create some of the more peripheral adaptations like tendon stiffness and hypertrophy. And, you know, that's muscle growth, basically. But that doesn't mean that it can't have a role in an overall comprehensive individual's goals as strength as an outcome. Does that make sense? I actually think the framing of strength as an outcome is really helpful for us because I think you've named a lot of so many things that, and I had like how you say in the weeds, you know, we Mm -hmm. hear this thing, we hear that thing. And, Mm -hmm. and I often, as we both are present on this social media roller coaster Mm -hmm. ride, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that is sometimes fun and sometimes absolutely not fun. Then you're also as teachers or educators, you're up against an algorithm that requires you to say, not requires you, but maybe Mm -hmm. motivates to say, well, strength is only this or Mm -hmm. yoga can only be that. So you see different people kind of saying different things like that, which then further muddies the water. And then I like the the more open-ended framing of, well, strengths and outcomes. So for mm-hmm. some people, as you said, pushing the floor away from them with the downward dog, mm-hmm. if they've never really done that, they will get stronger. Mm-hmm. Somebody else who can bench press 280 pounds, like down dog's not going to do the thing mm-hmm. that they think it's right. That's a helpful clarification mm-hmm. in the with the nuance of that strength mm-hmm. as an outcome. So then as teachers, as individuals, we know, as you've said, yoga can play that part, but it's not the only part. It's Mm -hmm. not this binary thinking Mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And that's helpful. Yeah. I mean, if someone's sedentary, you know, doing warrior one for a certain amount of time could, could lead to a little bit more strength in the, in the quadriceps. Now, how do we measure that is the real question. You know, is it going to translate to a heavier squat? Probably not because that's a different activity, you know, but could we, Could we measure it by, you know, like something like rate of force development in a clinic, you know, like maybe we could, like, what is their peak force capacity? Like that, that might be them getting stronger, but we don't do those sorts of measurements in yoga. So we end up having these conversations about measurable things without measuring them. And then we start arguing about them, but no one's even done any of the measurements, which is the funniest part, you know? So, um, yeah, I've, you know, I've gone like back and forth with this as like, what role does yoga have in, in the strength conversation? And I think I've like settled back on inviting it in as a small portion and probably more likely central nervous system adaptation related instead of peripheral um, tissue adaptation. And I'm inviting that back in because I, I am a huge advocate for yoga and it's changed so many lives, um, including my own. And I think that the, the, the resurgence or the emergence, I should say, of the strength conversation has really emphasized shaming yoga for how it's not enough and not good enough and not these, you know, and like, and, and we're, we're missing the point. Do you know what it, it's like? It, it's, it's like, I, I'm not going to yoga to, to, you know, PR my deadlift. They're not like that, like that, but that, that because I'm not going to yoga to PR my deadlift doesn't mean that yoga is like lacking all these things. You know, you, you, you you can have both. You can do both. You can, you, they can support each other. They can, you know, like in, in a myriad of ways. And that's why I like the strength as an outcome thing, especially with the central nervous system adaptation stuff, because coordination plays a role in getting stronger. And I think, 
you know, yoga is a really great opportunity to like know your body in space. Uh, it's really like proprioceptive and interoceptive and it's full of body awareness. And so like, like maybe that makes me better. I mean, we need to study all this, of course, but maybe that makes me better at being able to adapt in a coordinative way. And so maybe that it maybe because anytime you change an exercise, so let's just say you go from a deadlift to a single leg deadlift, you're, that's a new coordinative technique. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you need to, because now you don't have both feet on the ground, you have one foot on the ground. So you have to figure out how to hold your body weight, organize yourself. So like, like strength, strength adaptations or adaptations that relate to strength as an outcome aren't like this like single line. You know, like as soon as you change the weight or you go from dumbbells to barbell or you go from single leg to double leg, you, you kind of, you have to go through the whole myriad of adaptations in order to improve. So like, to me, it's like, why are we eliminating any, any other activity out of that conversation uh, when, you know, maybe I'm better at standing on one leg because of 20 years of yoga than somebody who's not. Um, and maybe those adaptations will come quicker to me. I don't know. Maybe they're not specific enough, but I'm, I'm welcoming the conversation is the point. I think deeper than that, of course, is acknowledging that those, if there is a discussion around what, like yoga is not enough, weight training is it, da, da, da. Well, then that missing the whole point that we are equating yoga as a physical practice, as if that's the be all and end all. And of course we know it's not. And so I think that's like the question under the question that we don't talk about or highlight enough. So it's almost like, here's the disclaimer right now, especially in this conversation here, us talking about the physical, mm -hmm. of course, yoga is not going to solve everything mm -hmm. and it's not going to be all of your physical needs, but love how you're showing that it will potentially equip us if we want to do strength mm -hmm. training. So that sense of about proprioceptive or nervous system strength is also not talked about. And again, that black and white thinking of strength equals building muscles. And yes, it does. Mm -hmm. But again, it's one I, part of it, <laughs> one part of it. And then mm -hmm. as we age, don't we want to be able to have balance and coordination mm -hmm. so that our quality of life is good mm -hmm. and better. And we're not going to fall and have those kind of outcomes, which all of these practices yoga asana strength training can do but yeah not they're not they're not in opposition to each other and i think that's a very good thing that you've shared i mean yes they're not in opposition to each other and at the same time like i i'm 100 percent an advocate for classic strength training i'm not saying that yoga should replace that but i'm also an advocate for doing a lot of other things that you love so like like you know it is, it is overwhelmingly clear that the more muscle mass you can maintain as you age, the healthier you will be. You know, muscles and endocrine and organ, it, it does amazing things. Like, but, and also at the same time, a lot of people live happy, healthy lives walking their dogs and never strength training. Do you know what I mean? And living to be 85. And like, so, so that's where it's like, it is, like you said, this binary thinking. It's like, you know, the strength advocates are like, you must do strength. And the yoga advocates are, you must do yoga. And then because if you must, must, then the yoga people are like, well, maybe if yoga accom accommodates the strength, then that's okay. It's like, it's, it's all okay. It's all okay. You know, like we were talking before we started, like I've been playing tennis on the regular, you know, I started playing once, twice a week. Now I'm like three, four times a week. I'm hooked. I, I still weight train. I still yoga, but tennis right now is my life. That is more important to me right now. And I'm an individual with free will and I get to make those choices and the things that bring me joy. And I'm still taking yoga classes and I'm still on the weight room floor and I'm still, but like, like you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't, I don't like, I don't, I couldn't imagine and this was in an email. Like I couldn't imagine if my tennis coach, coach was like, you know, tennis is great, but you know, it doesn't make you strong enough. It doesn't do that. Like would tell me all the things that it's missing. You know, he just, teaches me tennis because tennis is rad. Like, why can't we just teach yoga? Because yoga is rad and it makes you feel strong and it makes you feel good. And, you know, why does it have to be compared to something always, I guess, is my question. Yes, yes. And, and, and it makes me think, because I'm the same way, you know, I mountain bike, I've been strength training for the last like 10 plus years. Like these are all things that are very real in my life that give me so much and, and that, that yoga almost like, 
carries through into each of those activities. I'm not going to say mountain biking is yoga. I'm not going to say strength training is yoga, but what I learn and have learned in 20 plus years of practicing and teaching yoga about that self-awareness and building resilience Mm -hmm. and all these myriad of benefits from that practice, I see that as feeding into the other things that we love, that yoga mindset, Mm -hmm. that self-awareness, that help enhance you loving tennis, Mm -hmm. that help enhance or maybe give us the confidence to do something different that we're not used to doing. But yeah, thank you so much for naming (laughs) <laughs> the the weird cultural thing mm-hmm. of like why is it yeah why is the world all just like why can't it just be all of it we mm-hmm. are multifaceted mm-hmm. people and may yoga continue to shine a light on that and remind yes. us it's all enough and my arms are getting stronger playing tennis even though it's not strength training i'm just saying you know like i mean will they now again, will it translate into a stronger bench press? Probably not. But there, like, that's why it's a bigger conversation. You know, it's it's bigger than just building muscle. Okay, so that we this is a beautiful framework of recognizing. Okay, beautiful. We don't have to get caught in the weeds. We don't have to get binary about is it yoga or is it strength? Oh my goodness, I'm a yoga teacher practitioner. Do I have to start bringing strength training things into my yoga class, or should I throw yoga out with the bathwater? It's all of it, and it's none of it. And yoga can still be yoga and exist on its own, and everything else can. So yes to that framework. Like, what's your thoughts on having? mobility, hypermobility, like moving away from end ranges and trying to move that type of flexibility approach that we've had in our asanas and bringing in more, more mobility. What's your thoughts on that? Cause that's strength in that different way. Maybe strength in that proprioceptive way too, that you were talking about earlier. I struggle with that one. Um, to me, Mobility is kind of a little bit of a marketing term. So hypermobility is a is specifically, you know, a collagen variation. I'm saying that carefully because research is changing, of course. Neither one of those to me, like hypermobility or mobility, are really about range of motion so much. Um, so I, I naturally gravitate away from the range of motion conversation. Um, and I think it's just the things that you do that will help improve the range of motion that you need. So if you're a strength train, if you're training in strength, you're going to get the range of motion you need. And if that means you need to stretch your arms all the way overhead, that's a lot of range of motion for a lot of people. You know, you'll, they, they don't need to necessarily do separate flexibility or mobility or type work. Um, they just need to be able to, you know, achieve the task. Um, and that just naturally shows up in yoga. I think there's just, we just do a lot of things that not even end range as far as like deep flexibility, but just end range and getting your arms straight overhead. Like that is for the average person, that's not necessarily achievable, like to get into a stack for a handstand. And we do a lot of that in yoga. We spend a lot of poses reaching our arms overhead. So I think that's a a good thing. Um, Can you get it through strength? Yes. Can you get it through yoga and stretching? Yes. Can you get it through dynamic stretching, which I guess to me would be mobility work? Yes, you can. Like you can get it through all these different avenues. Uh, It it goes back to what we're saying with strength. Like what are the person's individual goals? What are their outcomes? It's, It's one thing to get your arm overhead. It's another thing to hold your body weight with your arm overhead in an inverted position. Then you're gonna have to do, you know, some some overhead pressing type, more classic strength type stuff that will help you. You don't have to, but it'll get you there faster. Again, if you understand the adaptations, you know, you need to increase your perception of effort to get greater motor unit recruitment. You need to build muscle um, and, you know, actually build muscle mass hypertrophy to be able to help with some of these things. So I think the whole mobility strength conversation again is just a it's back to like what we've been saying it's just a way to funnel people into the weeds so that they can say i know more than you do about this or you know more than i do about this you know we're talking about hypermobility that's a specific genetic condition that's different Um, that to me filters out separately from some of these terms of like what are the benefits of yoga or you know these other activities um, but I think that people with hypermobility benefit from both as well. It, it's, you know, they're, they're just in a different spectrum of 
of connective tissue behavior, but they can still benefit. Again, like one of the peripheral adaptations of strength is tendon stiffness. So if I know you have hypermobility uh, and I, you want to get stronger as a goal, I'm going to look at connective tissue behavior and I'm going to say, all right, well, coordination isn't enough to increase your, your connective tissue stiffness. So in that sense, maybe we are going to do some explosive stuff and some heavy loaded stuff. So again, like I'm, I'm just looking at all the variables that contribute to strength and then I can look at the individual and what their needs are. But I would say range of motion is probably not one unless it's not one of those components, unless the task requires it, you know, I don't know if that addressed your question kind of. I kind of love that there's no answer and the answer is just, okay, is it safe to say, I'm going to totally summarize and even that is tricky, but in a way from what I'm hearing you say, it's like, just let's move in a lot of different ways. Let's enjoy yoga for what it is. Yoga asana can be in a way that supports each individual. The other activities that we do can be wonderful, right? I love that there's no answer is what maybe I'm hearing about all of this. So when we came here to talk about strength, it's really just like what I'm hearing is yeah. Do you, you do, do you. you. <laughs> well, I think that's like, that, so that's, you know, you and I come from a very jaded perspective because of our time on social media and, and the, the anger and the debates out there. But what, why I think this is such an important conversation is because that, again, I'm using the term like industry pageantry feeds down into the student. They hear that stuff. They hear us bickering about whether this is good or whether this isn't good. And and I'm here to tell the regular yoga student, like, do what makes you happy. Do what, do what you need to do in your life. Do, do the things that will satisfy the goals that you have. You know, now again, it's like, it, there is no denying that hypertrophy building muscle mass is, is essential and urgent. And also some people don't do it and they still are okay. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, that's where I'm like, like, like it, you know, it, it's essential that that a, a well-rounded diet is good for, you know, your health and longevity. And also, my mother was on the macrobiotic diet, which is one of the healthiest diets there is, and still died of cancer at a young age. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, like, so I'm not, I'm not saying she shouldn't have done that. I'm just saying, like, 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 there, nothing is a guarantee. So, so, like, if, if, if you are madly in love with yoga five days a week and it's feeding you and your body, there are benefits to it. And they might not be the same benefits that you get from running around a tennis court or lifting heavy weights, but that's great. I'm happy for you. And I support you on that journey. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like it, it, it now, now if you, you know, are, have a specific reason for a specific need for a certain thing, then absolutely you should also pursue that. But and we get so caught up, this is a very philosophical conversation, but we get so caught up in what you need to do to live the healthiest, longest life possible. Um, and we're sold that. We're sold in this complex world of marketing and capitalism that, that you should always be striving to be the healthiest and the best and the strongest and the this and the that. And even if you don't have time for it or money for it or the energy for it, or, you know what I mean? And it's like, otherwise you're failing morally, you know, it's like, like you, if you don't eat right and exercise right and do this, you're a moral failure. You don't deserve to da, da, da. like, that's really what's sold to us. And I think that subliminal messaging gets wrapped up in our industry conversations on that's why we're comparing what is, what is more important, what is less important why you need range of motion, why you need to be able to touch your toes, why you need to be able to get on and get on and off the ground. And yes, of course, I think you need all of those things. I'm not saying like, oh, but like, like go about them in a way that, that makes you like happy and, and, and supported and gives you community. And is, I would rather, I would rather go for a two hour walk with my friends than be alone in a dingy hotel gym lifting weights if I had a choice. You know what I'm saying? Now that doesn't mean I should, that 
now people are going to listen to that and be like, Jewel says you shouldn't lift weights and walking is better. You know, like, no, that's not at all what I said. <laughs> but like when, I, when I'm weighing the two and I have the, oh, so much time, you know, like that's what, like, that's what's important. And I think we forget that um, because we're just sold, like be the best and be the healthiest. And that's, there's only one solution. You know, there's one solution. That's what you have to do. Yes. A million times. <laughs> yes. And I think, and I love, love, love this. Cause I think maybe this is what needs to get talked about more and more is that, that again, framework in which we see all of this mm -hmm. is the billion dollar health and wellness mm -hmm. industry that profits off of our insecurities. Can I also think too, in our human nature too, we, there's safety in, security of binary thinking again there's mm -hmm. safety and security and like yes tell me the five different mm -hmm. foods to eat or never to eat yes tell me to never do x mm -hmm. and then we can feel confident and strong because we've put our power into something else mm -hmm. when really and you as a scientist knows this better than anybody of like <laughs> knowledge is always changing those external authority sources are always if we're really honest about that in terms of research that's always shifting and changing so staying in that black and white thinking of this is the only way does us a disservice and then that maybe for me leads us back to the practice of yoga and one of the deeper benefits that our practice can give us beyond the physical asana is that discernment Mm -hmm. And to see the stories underneath the stories, to see the culture that we are all swimming in and how it informs and distorts our experiences and that need for safety and security of an external authority telling us right and wrong and what to do. And I'll also, I feel like every episode I've recorded, I mentioned about bro science mm -hmm. and stuff because... I just see it, you know, with these, with these like podcasters out there who are generally white guys and they're like talking about, here's your protocol and here's the, then, and, and, and we're all just, and it just seems like the world is just like, yes, tell us, please tell me the way to do this. And so Jules, is just such a wonderful breath of fresh air that and I, and I just want to offer too, like you're, you could absolutely be doing that. You could be that person, you know, I'm a biomechanic scientist. I'm da, da, da. So thank you for being you and not being that and continuing to feed people or offer people, Hey, there's other ways. It's all good. And I'm sure I'm going to make assumption. You tell me right or wrong. You'll have people that come to your classes and trainings too, that are like, Jules, tell me this mm -hmm. is the right and wrong way. Mm -hmm. And how do yep. you navigate that? So for the people? yeah, I'll teach a whole flexibility thing, teach them six different ways to stretch. And then they'll be like, what, so what's the best way? And I'm like, what do you mean? Have you not been listening for the last 10 hours? It happens all the time. Or like, I just want to know what my, my, my cousin who has an ankle injury, what the best way for him to stretch is. I'm like, I don't know. I got a lot more questions about than you know, an ankle injury that doesn't mean anything to me what does he do what does he want to do How, where you know like um and but i do i do want to say that you touched on like research and binary thinking and i think that that is another part of the trap because the more involved you get in reading research which i highly recommend everybody do i'm like i'm, I'm that's my like next mission is to help people with uh, research literacy you realize that research also isn't binary it's I'm going to use your term, the bro science, but it is the interpretation of the research that is binary. So, so research is always changing, but it's not always changing in the sense that it's like, oh, there's this, and then there's this, and then there's this. We have studies that say, oh, there's this, and then there's this, and then there's this. But research as a body of knowledge is always moving us closer to the truth, but never to the truth. So it's just helping us be less wrong, I guess, is what I'm getting at. So, so I think what, then that's the next part that happens is that someone is like, well, research says you need muscle mass. It's like, we know you need muscle mass, but when you start like compounding the actual environment of the person and whatever, whatever adaptations they need, the research doesn't say that the research says that about this particular group of people and, da, 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 you know, so it, 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 the whole industry of research is also victim to the same wellness, you know, uh, capitalist movement of, we have to get it right. We have to know what the truth is when research just gets us closer. It never gets us there. Um, so that's helpful. I think thinking as well is when you like, when you hear someone give a protocol, like you gave as, as, a, as an example, that's fine. The protocol is fine. The protocol
protocol is an interpretation of that person's understanding and education. That's what it is. And it's fine. But it's not the only, the right, the correct, the one all be all, you know what I mean? It, and it was probably for a specific population in mind, if not just for one person, but for you know the type of people that that person trains, which is different than the type of people that I train or whatever. So like all of it is contextual and all of it is nuanced. And our world of you know 30 second sped up videos with a caption doesn't allow for for that. And it's just, it's, it's a struggle. It's like, we, we have so much education at our fingertips now because of social media. Like it's amazing. I mean, the volumes of information just with podcasts and I mean, you can get a free education. Problem is, is yet you don't know what's valuable and you're missing context and nuance. Cause a lot of it is you know, abbreviated and, and shortened and sold. And, you know, it just, it, the, the information is an all time high. And then the ability to sort through the weeds and think critically about that information is at an all time high as well. If that makes sense. They go hand in hand. Well, I love that vision or what you said just about like research is like a body of research heading towards the truth, but never getting mm -hmm. towards the truth. I love that. Cause then there's that freedom then to go, I won't get all the answers, right? Mm -hmm. It's not all bad. It's not all good. We're heading in a direction of understanding mm -hmm. and learning. And I, and I just want to parallel that again with like, again, the deeper practice of our yoga, we're never going to know ourselves completely ever till the day we die. Hopefully we're still learning and understanding. And that's the point. So I love that sort of my Micro to the macro mm -hmm. parallel perspective of research and our own and yoga being our own self research in a way one could say. If we knew yeah, the answers, and... we'd reach samadhi. We wouldn't need yoga <laughs> anymore, <laughs> right? <laughs> So I hope that this gives, as we listen to this, because I like, I love that. And for us talking about this too, I love it was like, let's come on, Jules, come on to this podcast and let's talk strength and let's talk strength around yoga and yoga asana. What does this mean? And let's unpack it. And I love that what ended up showing up was actually you, you said being in the weeds, so I'm going to use that again, because I think we're in good weeds. And so, because to me, I'm like, that's the uncertainty. That's mm -hmm. out of that binary thinking and going, actually, I don't know everything. And maybe it's all good. And maybe I'm getting more stressed out. And so I'm speaking to some of the yoga mm -hmm. teachers out there, probably. Maybe I'm getting more stressed out as a teacher, because I'm hearing all this stuff that Jules has named. And I have my own practice and experience, but then I want to be a good teacher and I want to do it all. And, blah, blah. and then we're actually spending so much more time in our heads mm -hmm. in these abstractions looking for answers and not connecting into our mm -hmm. own wisdom and our own and experience and our own mistakes and all the things mm -hmm. and embracing it all and I think this is exciting and I hope us having this conversation of like there there's so many answers and there's no answers mm -hmm. and this is a beautiful place to be and, and I'm grateful for that practice of curiosity and uncertainty yeah and I will say that like, there are things we know. There are definitely like, like education is hugely important. There are things we know. It's just the difference is just because we know this doesn't make it mean something every time. Do you know what I mean? So like, we didn't talk, I, I you know, I, I can do a full lecture on the adaptations of strength and that you will walk out educated. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like you will learn. Like that could be a three, four hour lecture. In fact, it is, I have a course on it. You know what I mean? Like where you really learn what all of these mean, how they work. Uh, well, the terms mean, I should say how they work, whatever. But I think what happens is, is we fall victim to like kind of marketing terms and, and promoting things as our education when it's like, that's just us get out in the world interacting. And then there's the education and the education is what actually helps us make sense of all of that. You know what I mean? Like when you really understand all of the adaptations related to strength, then we can have this nuance. Like you and I are having a very philosophical conversation because this isn't an education course. So we're just discussing like what, you know, but I think when you hear like, let's just say like motor unit recruitment is an adaptation for strength. 
you know, and then somebody do goes and then like sells you this whole thing because they made motor unit recruitment mean something over here, you know, when really it's just like, what is it? How do you get it? You know, and then it's later, it's like, does the student need it? Is that part of what their, you know, their goals are and da, da, da. And if so, I know now, now know how to get it and da, da, you know, like how to measure it and all those things. Um, but that isn't what's in the, the popular conversation. And so I think that's the, the mess. Like I always say, don't confuse your marketing for your education because they're two different things. And I'm not saying marketing is bad. Like, you know, when I was like, oh, mobility is my, it's just like, they're terms that we use loosely. Strength is a marketing term. It really is. Stability is a marketing term. And until you like really pull out, like in the beginning, what is strength? How is it measured? How am I using it in this conversation? But as a loose term, I can't make it mean all these things. As a loose term, it's just a general term until I'm actually like trying to apply it. And that's where I am an advocate for education. And that's why research is important because there are things we know. Um, we just have to be careful to jump to conclusions about them, I guess. So helpful. And I think that in what you just said is, is, again, we don't hear very often. We don't hear that framework of like, it's because you're right, it's conflated. We're in capitalism. We mm -hmm. really just need to sell things and have mm -hmm. people understand and need the, what's the benefit? How's it going to, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and it's it okay. is so, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> you know, one of many lessons here is like, keep learning. Mm -hmm. in whatever form and whatever interests you mm -hmm. as a teacher. Um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Jules has lots of education and go take it, please, everybody. Uh, where you can kind of hear this education in more wonderfully nerdy terms. Mm -hmm. I had a teacher years and years ago who just talked about it, like confused on a higher level. Mm -hmm. Which makes you more confident in being a little less absolutist and being a little, and, and, and being you know, in the face of uncertainty, you know, that makes you more comfortable with that. So being confused on a higher level is good. I like that. Yeah. Well, in my experience with our teacher trainings, for example, like people, and you'll have probably felt this teachers coming in and wanting to, again, have that a final official I've mm -hmm. graduated and now I'm going to know it all. And we've brought in more information. We're, that information we're learning is melding with the old information that we mm -hmm. have. Does it work? Does it make sense? So I love that you're out there really sharing with us a different way. And this is what I like to think of for myself, sometimes I say this about my business is like a trying to do capitalism differently. And so I think you're another example of that, of like trying to do capitalism trying. and teaching <laughs> and within the system that we're in, of course, but showing different ways. And I think you've inspired many teachers out there because that sort of like ask those questions and find different answers or no answers or some good answer. And I think you give a really great opportunity for that for people. And I'm glad you're out here doing that. Yeah. Thanks. And I want to say that all the yoga teachers that are listening, sell your, sell your classes. <laughs> like I, you know, because I, like, w like I don't, I think a lot of times then when, when I'm critical of marketing, people are like, Oh, you know, sell your classes, fill your classes. There are ways to be authentic and sell and, and, and help people and sell, you know, it's, it, to me, it's like, I guess the first step is to like shift away from like the fear and kind of like shift toward the like hopeful and the supportive. Um, just as a little anecdote, if we have time, mm -hmm. right before this, I was on a call with uh, like a CEO of this new product who it's like a, a product that is, you know, supposed to help your wellness, you know, <laughs> I won't get into the details, uh, but they wanted some input from me. And they were looking, they're, good, they're not in the industry, right? They're just, this is a CEO. So he knows how to run a company, but knows nothing about pain science and, and, and biomechanics and exercise or anything, rehab. And so I was like talking to him a little bit about his sales page and like the, the product benefits page, you know? And it was like, I, I, there was a lot of like, you know, posture correction, like, think, you know, a lot of things that we are kind of learning don't necessarily need to happen, but I was really supportive of him. And I was like, I was like, you do it in a really nice way that is like not telling people that they're, you know, they're like, like it, everybody knows posture, everybody knows mobility, everybody knows strength, everybody knows, these are all buzzwords, but he like framed them in a way that wasn't like, 
your pain is caused by this, you know, it was like, it, it, like, can you, can you touch on people's pain points? Um, and they're the things that are concerning to them. They want to feel stronger. They want to be more stable. They want to increase range of motion. Can you like, you know, address those things in a hopeful way instead of like, this is, these are all the things that are wrong with you way. So anyway, we had, he and I had a really nice conversation. Um, it was, uh, very educational for me just to talk to someone like that. And he learned a lot too. And, and then would fall back into like, oh, well, maybe it's because of the glute activation or whatever. And I was like, but does that really matter? And, you know, so we had a really nice back and forth. And I think yoga teachers, like the more back to like, the more you study these things, the more confident you are to hold an uplifting message without promising that you're fixing something. And so you can still sell yourself and engage in society and in capitalism and fill your classes, you know, but you're, 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 you're promising something that's a little bit more tangible, I think, than um, something that is destructive. I can, yeah, I can imagine some people are listening to this going, Oh my yeah, God, I can never use the word strength again, you can. never yes, you use can. flexibility, mobility. Yes, I know. Cause I think about that all the time too. And I'm writing a caption on Instagram. Let's say it's like, who yes. am I talking to? And it's even that kind of question too, sometimes where people move your thigh bone or move your femur and like, no, say the words that the average person will understand. Most mm -hmm. people won't understand mm -hmm. the word femur necessarily, depending on your audience. So it's okay to use these words and just know that it's nuanced. And, and, mm -hmm. I, and I think that's actually a really helpful extra little way to frame it is just trusting that when we're movement positive about it and that's not this like doom and gloom this is the only way you're never gonna da 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 but instead being like yeah mobility doing this in a different way can help your mobility can help your flexibility mm -hmm. can help your stability yeah then we can, can feel more confident so yeah. like, uh, like people people in pain have have good posture and people not in pain <laughs> not in pain have bad posture you know what i'm trying to say but also as a culture, it's not bad to say like, oh, this little stretch improves your posture. But like, it, like everybody wants better posture. Do you know what I mean? But instead of saying the posture is the cause of your damage, that is like that where we, that's, that's not supported. But it's okay as a society to want to stand taller and feel brighter and, you know, all of the things that come along with it. So that's what I'm saying. Like use these terms for your audience in, in a nice, loose, uplifting way. It's, mm -hmm. you don't have to shy away from them because mm -hmm. I have a whole laundry list of what strength actually means. That, <laughs> don't let that stop you. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm certainly not on the internet looking at all your captions, judging them. I promise you I am not. Somebody else is doing that, but it's not me. <laughs> I'm like, yes, fill your classes. Yes. Exactly. Spread the good word of, yes. you know, healthy, happy movement yes. and feeling good in our body, mind and heart. Yes. I find it's sometimes just as like, it's like move so that you can have the capacity to do what you want in the world, you know? do these yes. things that can help you feel good and so again as you already framed like what are the other things so if strength training feels good do it and we know it's helpful for us so do it too mm -hmm. but also do this and that and that and at different phases and stages of our life too mm -hmm. sometimes that conversation doesn't show up mm -hmm. either of like okay what worked for me two years ago isn't working for me now how do i shift and change and let's use our yoga practice for self-awareness, discern some of these cultural conditionings and these things that we've interpreted and, and, and individualized. And so thank you for being mm -hmm. one of the beautiful, strong, clear voices out there as offering something positive and different and, and well learning, well exploring, well nerding out on all of the amazingness that our bodies are, because you also share dissection courses, you do mm -hmm. teacher trainings, the webinars. So if people want to find you, of course, highly recommend a dissection course that is like nothing compares to that. <laughs> nothing. Talk a little bit about any of that stuff. Do I, I do anatomy labs twice a year. So I just got back from one highly recommend. Like you said, um, we talk a lot about tissue mechanics in that, in that, in my labs, it's like really, um, the focus of it. Um, and then, yeah, I do a 300 hour teacher training and I do online courses and I teach in person and I have a book. I'm trying to work on my second book. 
I just can't get, I need like three hours of nothing else to think about. And that's just not happening. But I have the whole book m mapped out in my head. I just got to get the proposal in and start writing it. So. What's it going to be about? Is there a sneak? Like what, is this like part two or is yeah, there something kind totally of. different? I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to make it like a sequel. Um, Cause like the first book is all about like why range of motion doesn't matter. Um, and why like stretching is about mechanical tension and all that. So it's very like technical. And so I'd like to bring back stretching and range of motion as like the second part, like pick up where I like didn't, you know, cover it in the first book, trying to figure out how to like do that as a sequel, you know? So I'm I like the book is there. I just don't know what it's going to be called or if it's going to tie into the first as much as I want it to or not. Mm -hmm. we'll see. Mm -hmm. it's percolating it's just yeah. when when the time is right it will all kind of yeah. come out yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of work it's hard to do when you have a full inbox it's hard to like clear the space you know <laughs> mm -hmm. well thank you so much for being here for having this be ending up to be a more philosophical conversation yeah. i think that is much good. needed and important so mm -hmm. thank you for that yeah that was great Appreciate it. so good